I'm so glad that Brandon gives me an opportunity to talk with you guys occasionally. And so tonight is one of those nights. Uh, we're in a series called You Asked For It. And so some of you have submitted some questions to us, asking us uh, to talk about some of these issues and some of the questions that you have. And so tonight we are going to try to continue that. I'm going to do my very best. And uh, I have to agree with Brandon a bit on this. Um, I think he got all the fun questions Chris did. And um, Brandon and I got the leftovers. Just kidding. So some of these are going to be fun. You can see that I've listed those inside the bulletin. And just imagine you having to talk about some of those things, okay? But here's what we're going to do. And I want everybody to look at me real quick if you can because I want you to understand this. I know that there's people here from a lot of different backgrounds. I know, and Mike, can I have just a little bit more monitor? Because I feel like I have to talk louder than I really do if I don't have monitor. But some of us are from all different backgrounds. And so some of you are here tonight and you're just checking out God. Okay? You don't really know uh, what you believe or what you want to know about Him or what you believe yet. And that's cool. So glad that you're here. Some of you grew up in church and you've kind of heard all these things, but you're kind of developing your own sense of beliefs and your own belief system, and I commend you for that. You should do that. You should never believe anything just because someone said it from here. You should always go to God's Word and find out for yourself. That's always very, very important. But just to let you know, I have chosen to base my life on God and God's Word and what He says. So everything that uh, Brandon, Chris, and I, and some of the students that will speak, we are, are saying these things based on the fact that we have made the decision to follow Christ, and so we want to bring into life what He says. However, again, we want you to check it out for yourself. It's very important that you do that. The Bible doesn't say specifically or speak to specifically some of the things that you guys have asked. So we just kind of have to infer from what we understand about the whole Bible um, in, in ways that we can explain that best we can. Because we do not know everything. We are only giving uh, what we believe the Bible says from our very small minds, okay? So I want you to know that up front. With all that said, we're going to jump right in to the very first question. Uh, before I go any further, just to make you uh, aware or remind you, uh, that in your bulletin there's a connection card before I forget. Please fill that out. Listen, if you've been here 50 times, if you've been here 100 times, if it's your first time, please fill that out because we want to know that you're here. We want to pray for you this week. And there's some decisions that we're going to make together at the end. And you make a clinical prize if you turn in your card. So, please fill that out. Question number one. I don't know if whoever uh, submitted this question was serious, but we thought it'd be fun to try to answer was Lazarus a zombie? Well, let me just preface this by saying who Lazarus was, okay, if you don't know. In the New Testament, in the book of John, there is a man named Lazarus. And he has two sisters, Mary and Martha. Some of you may have heard of him. Lazarus is sick, and while he is sick, Mary and Martha call for Jesus. I don't know how they did this, obviously not phones, but they sent word that Jesus, to Jesus, wasn't around, please come and heal Lazarus because he's going to die. Well, Jesus stayed gone too long in their eyes, okay? Lazarus dies. They put him in the tomb. They put him in a cave. They kind of rolled the stone in front of it, sort of like what you and Jesus put in when he died. And he's been there like three days. Then Jesus shows up. Mary and Martha are mad. They're like, Jesus, if you had come earlier, if you would have come sooner, our brother would not have died. And Jesus kind of says, in some words, calm down, woman. It's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of this. And so, you can look. I'm not going to put all these verses on your outline. So, if you want to just make some notes and jot down where they're found, that's cool. This one's not that big a deal. It's just kind of obvious. John 11 and 43 is going to be on the screen, I believe. And it says this. Now when Jesus had said these things, He cried out with a loud voice. This is one of those zombie questions or things or, or asked. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who died came out bound, hand and foot, with gray clothes. 
zombie like, I would say. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him, now there's the kicker, and let him go. So, a man was dead. Jesus healed him of his deadness. <laughs> raised him to life. And now he is alive. He is healed of his deadness. And so they say, take off the grave clothes and let it go. This is where I think the zombie transition takes place, okay? This is why I think possibly no, he was not a zombie. John 12, 1 through 2. Okay, let's go to the next few weeks in Lazarus' life. Now that he's raised from the dead. Six days before Passover, Jesus went to Bethany, the home of who? The man who he had raised from what? And they prepared a dinner for him, him there, which Martha helped serve. That's how we know it's the same Lazarus. And Lazarus is one of those who were sitting at the table with Jesus. So, in my opinion, Lazarus is now alive. He is no longer dead. He is no longer in great clothes. He no longer looks decayed. He was healed of his deadness. And now he's alive at the table eating with Jesus. So, I believe if we were to scientifically say yes or no, I would say no. And the reason, too, because later we think probably Lazarus died again, and then Jesus did not heal him of his deadness. He just died. Okay, stay that way. Okay? Kind of makes sense to you? Uh, that's my take on that. Now, question number two, we're going to take a quick turn. This question, question number two, uh, it breaks my heart. It, this is the question, and this is a, actually a very popular question that you guys ask, either because maybe you or someone you know is dealing with this issue. Is self-harm a sin? Self-harm a sin? Let me say this up front before we get into this question. I believe that church and youth group should be the safest place for people to share their, their struggles, period. Do you agree with that? Church and youth group should be the safest place for, for students, for kids, for adults to share their problems and their issues. We should not judge we should not make fun. We should not, um, you know, give people a hard time for sharing their struggles no matter what. Now, let me just say that help for issues like this comes in a lot of different forms, okay? A lot of different forms. In fact, you know, coming to church and surrounding yourself with people that care about you, that love you, that are praying for you is a great form of help. You know, being around people that, that want the best for you, that is a great form of finding help. Another form of help, obviously, would be loving parents that you can go to. Maybe it may take multiple times to talk with them through, through the situation. They may not understand at first. But loving parents would be another form of help, you know, that we would want you to embrace if you or someone you know is struggling with this type of issue. And then thirdly, professional help. None of us on staff at this church are professional counselors. None of us have a professional degree in counseling. Maybe one day we may have that. I don't know. But basically, we can tell you from God's Word and then help you get professional help for these kinds of issues. We do that all the time with people. We have a great list of counselors that want to help students, that want to help little kids, that want to help your moms and your dads, you know, with whatever it is. Now, all those types of help may not come in that, in that order, Maybe all different kinds of orders, but I just wanted to let you know what types of help maybe that you could be looking for. People that harm themselves do it for a variety of reasons, and I can't uh, pretend to understand that. That's not been something that I have experienced myself, but from what I've learned from being around maybe students that do or learning from people that have been through this issue, we do have people in our church that have struggled with this, that have overcome this issue, is that sometimes it just is better in their mind to hurt themselves rather than deal with the issues at hand. Sometimes it's easier to inflict pain on themselves rather than because they don't have the words to emotionally uh, explain what's going on in their heart and in their mind. 
The thing to remember, though, is that when we inflict pain on ourselves, whether it's through you know, cutting, whether it's through uh, drug abuse, whether it's through alcohol abuse or whatever, is that when we finish hurting ourselves, when we get through a, a binge or we get through a stage that we're, we're doing these things to ourselves, that the pain always ensues much larger. It always comes back worse. Like, it goes away maybe in your mind, you're getting your mind off of it, but it always comes back worse. And so that's why we have to help others get through these kinds of things. Another reason that it's harmful to us is that it's sort of an addiction. Because many people can't overcome it on their own. They have to find help, like just like a person that maybe is dealing with a drug issue or dealing with alcohol issues. They need help getting through that because they can't stop on your own. So here's the question. Is self-harm a sin? Here's the thing. If you ask Jesus to be the leader of your life, you are a Christian. If you are reading God's Word and following what it says, then you are a Christ follower. But let me say on the flip side that if you're inflicting harm on yourself in some way, that you're not living life to the fullest that God has for you. And if you continue down that road, then yes, it probably will lead to sin. Because you're not fixing your mind on the problem solver. You're just trying to put band-aids on things temporarily. Jeremiah 29, 11. This is a, a verse that I would love for you please just to write down Jeremiah 29, 11 under number 2. You can do that. You don't have to write out the verse. Just maybe where it's found. This is God's plan for you. He says, this is God speaking to you. Okay? In your mind, when I say uh, you, I want you to say your name in your mind. Okay? For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Not to harm you. That's God's plan for all of us. Therefore, as God's kids, as a child of God, we need to do whatever we can do to continue on our path of healing. When we're trying to get through problems, when we're trying to get through situations, we need to do whatever we can do. If it takes two counselors, three counselors, ten counselors, before you figure out the one that's right for you. If it takes three conversations, ten conversations, a hundred conversations with your parents, it's worth it. If it takes going through three, five, ten adults to talk through this till you can get a plan for your healing, that's what God has for you. You have to tell somebody. Let me let me just if you don't get anything else for this point, look at me at, right now with this. Secrets are bad. Secrets from your parents are worse. Secrets are inside that will kill you if you don't get it out. Pastor Jeff said something all the time, and he says this, you're only as sick as your secrets. If you get it out, then starts the healing process. If you tell someone, then starts the healing process. Secrets are bad, especially when it comes to someone's health, someone's well-being. Secrets are not good. So please, please tell someone. I have a very special friend that's here tonight. Julie's thing, can you raise your hand? We love Julie so much. Julie is, her testimony is amazing. Julie, I asked her could I say this publicly. Julie was a cutter. She would love to talk to anybody that has thought of this, is doing this, you have a friend you know, she would love. Julie, you can talk to Julie about anything. Please talk to someone. If you're a group leader here tonight and you just don't feel qualified to talk 
about what some people are telling you, some students are telling you, please refer them to someone. Please guide them to someone, to someone in the leadership, to a staff member, whatever. We want to do whatever we can. Why? Because church and youth group should be the safest place for you and your friends to come and share whatever they need to. Safest place. If you believe that, say amen. 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 Alright, number three. Should age in a relationship matter? Okay, I have to admit, just straight up front, okay? Danny Wade, it's my hot husband Danny. I am four years and nine months older than him. So, in our thirties, does age in a relationship matter? Probably not. You know, he says I'm getting old sometimes, but other than me getting smacked in the head, it doesn't matter. Now, when he was 10 and I was 15, did it matter? Yes. Probably. That's weird. When I was 20 and he was 15, did it matter? Yes. Probably. I was in college, he was learning to drive. That's weird. Yes. Okay? <laughs> or silly things. I don't know. <laughs> Doing things. <laughs> well, I don't have a lot of scripture about this one. Just let me say this up front, okay? Here's the thing. Number one, if your parents are asking you not to date someone, we did a whole message about this, about obeying your parents. Scripture is very clear about this. Exodus 20 and 12 says, Obey your father and your mother. That is just black and white, people. There is nothing I can do about that. Your parents have been to the future. You need to listen to them. You need to honor what they're telling you. And hey, listen, if you, I know you're in love or in deep light, but if you are, which I believe it can happen, hopefully not with a 10-year-old, but I believe that you'll wait, or they'll wait for you, okay? That, it's just that simple. Number two, as far as legal matters go, if you are of legal age, and your boyfriend or your girlfriend isn't, people get accused of things every day that they have done or have not done. Either way, a lot of heartache comes with that, okay? Just let me leave it at that. Number three, this is a little extreme, I know, but let's say you're 20 and you marry a 40-year-old, okay? Now, maybe weird to think of right now, however, I've seen it happen. At 20 and 40, you know, I hate to tell you this, I'm approaching that age, and I would, you know, I, I kind of get it at this age, you know, 20, 40, whatever, that might work. But let me just say what might be more difficult is 40 and 60, okay? That 20-year-old, that 40-year-old, one day is going to be 40 and 60. I've seen this twice in my life with two couples. The first couple, 20 years apart, loved each other till his wife passed away at like 70 years of age. I mean, he was like in his late 50s. Just, you would not believe this the most coolest relationship ever. The other one that I saw, very difficult at 40 and 60. One's about to retire, and she's just like, man, I, I want to go bowling. And he's like, I'm tired, you know. I, I got a real big day on my back and stuff, you know, all this. Where's the heat pad? I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble. It, listen, it's extreme, but just something to think about, okay? Question number four. I'm going to summarize this one a bit, okay? What about gay people? The Bible said that God made a woman to be with man, but the rest of the Bible states how you should love everyone, including gay people. Let me just say this up front. God loves everyone, and the church should too. Period. God loves everyone, and the church should too. 
Mark 12, 31 does say, Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as who? It doesn't say love people like me. It doesn't say love people with my skin color. It doesn't say love people who like the same things that I like. It just says love your neighbor as yourself. Treat others the way that you want to be treated. Now, with that being said, it doesn't say that I have to approve of everything everyone else does. We use the word tolerance. You guys probably hear that a lot in school. You probably hear that a lot in your life. Tolerance is a word that's a good word and it simply means that I should treat everyone with dignity and respect no matter who they are. I agree with that. However, we have went a little too far with that sometimes. And some people believe that tolerance means not only should I treat you with dignity and respect, but you should believe what I believe is true. And that's not the case. The way I believe, and I told you up front, I have dedicated my life to God. I'm going to follow His Word. The way I believe, I have beliefs, and I believe my beliefs are true because I believe God's Word is true. It doesn't mean that you have to believe like me. You can treat me with dignity and respect. But it doesn't mean that I have to believe like you either. We went a little too far at times with the word tolerance. Now, I know this wasn't really a part of the question, but I want to give you our church, Stockbridge Community Church, a stance on what we believe about marriage and relationships. Okay, I think it's up here on the screen. At SDC, our stance as a church is that human sexuality is to be, as we believe the Bible says, is to be between one man and one woman who are married. That's what we believe. Any other type of sexual act, uh, human sexuality, we believe the Bible says is sin. In other words, if I have sex before marriage, the Bible calls that fornication, and that is a sin. If I am married and I and, and I or someone else has sex with people that they are not married to, that is adultery, and the Bible calls that sin. If a man has sex with a man or a woman with a woman, the Bible calls that homosexuality and describes that as sin. I'm going to show you the verse, and I'm only showing you the verse because this was part of the question. This was what the question was referring to. So you can look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 with me. But I want to pull something out of this that I feel like needs to be said as well. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or, or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheap people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. This is the kicker here. This is so good. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You are made holy. You are made right with God. How? By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Is any of the other sins listed in this worse than any of the others? Is greed worse than adultery or cheating worse than homosexuality or homosexuality worse than uh, those who abuse? No, they're all the same in God's eyes. They're all the same. None is worse than any of the others. And sometimes in the church, we try to make it that way. Bottom line is this. No matter what a person is or claims to be, should we love them? Yes. If they're greedy, should we love them? Yes. If they commit adultery or abuse other people or cheat them, do we like it? No. But should we love them as the church? Yes. Does God? Yes. The bottom line is love everyone. Love everyone. Treat everyone as you want to be treated. Number five. Do. Does God really know everything? How is that even possible? I don't know. <laughs> I don't claim to know uh, how big God is uh, because I'm not Him. 
Um, I can't. That's why he is God. But there is some scripture. There's one scripture that I think is so cool. And again, because I based my life on Jesus Christ and God's word, I believe that he does know everything. And I don't understand how, but, but this, is, this is the verse that I want to share with you. Psalm 139. It says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know what? Everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my what? Even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know what? I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I God knows everything about me. He knows everything about you. And He knows everything about every other set of the seven billion people that live in this world. He knows. But there is one thing that God chooses not to know. And I just wanted to bring this out because I think it's so cool. Isaiah is the next verse that I want to throw up on the screen. 43 and 25. I, as I alone, will blot out your sins for my own sake and I will never what? Of them again. When you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, He throws them as far away as the east is from the west, and He says He will not remember them ever again. That is cool. God will not remember or think about that. Number six. Is cursing a sin if you swear to God and break the swear, can you be forgiven? Let's just go to the, God, the Bible on this one. It's cursing a sin. Let's look at Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt what? Come out of your... I'm going to stop right there. Colossians 3 and 8 says, Put away all obscene talk. This is not on the screen. James 3 and 10 says, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. This shouldn't be. Is cursing a sin? If God says don't do it, and we do it, I think that's a sin. What does the Bible say about swearing to God? Look at James 5 and 12. But above all, my brothers, do not what? Either by who? Or by or by any other oath. But let your yes be what? And your no be what? So that you may not fall under condemnation. Here's the thing. God's saying, don't even go that far. Be such a person of character and integrity that your yes is believable and your no is believable. That you don't even have to swear. You don't have to say, I swear on, on this, my mom's grave, I swear. But you're just so honest that nobody even questions. How do you get that way? You do what you say you're going to do. Now, if you have sworn to God and you broke that swear, that promise, is that a sin? Can you be forgiven? Let's look at 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful, not faithful. Faithful and just and will what? And purify us from all what? If I sin and ask Jesus to forgive me and I mean it, does He forgive me? Yes. He forgives you. Now should you just sin just so you can ask for forgiveness? No. Don't do that. Your salvation was bought at a great price. Let's go to question number seven. I'm sorry I'm going over on time. Really publicly sorry. Okay. Number seven, do children go to hell? Do children go to hell? Let's look at what Jesus said. I'm just going to sum it up real quick. We were all born into sin, okay? It doesn't mean that when you were born you did sinful things. Obviously you were a baby. But we all inherited a sinful world because Adam and Eve fell. Well, the disciples went to Jesus one day and they said, Jesus, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he just, they just knew that Jesus was going to pick one of them. And Jesus said, hey, you kid, come here. And the kid came and stood by Jesus. And Jesus kind of said this in Matthew 18 and 24. He said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like a little kid, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the what? the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Next, a little while later, the, the parents heard this. They bring their kids to Jesus. The disciples are like, whoa, the crowds are too big. Get back. Jesus is tired. Jesus said, whoa, don't, don't 
stop the little kids from coming to me. He says, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Does Jesus love kids? Yes.